this flow. While my students thought it was a good idea to write OMG here, and it is not, oh my god, it's opt optical micro manipulation group. <laughs> <laughs> and so this is done, this is quite curious, this is actually done with um, a spatial light modulator. It's just to show that you can play with the light. Um, whichever way you want really. And we have seen that one before. Okay, so um, now there was another slide. No, there wasn't another slide. Ah, okay. So I was going to start with that again. So what what I want to finish up with today is to show you how we can measure under the momentum of light. And specifically also under the momentum of light, both very directly and somewhat indirectly. And then uh, we also, if we have time, we will look at using this orbital angular momentum of light for driving micro machines a little bit more than what we did yesterday. Okay, so uh, let me just put this one up. And so, um, how can we do measurement of orbital angular momentum? Remember, I showed you yesterday that it, there is a very simple method of measuring spin angular momentum. Right? And this is just to know the spin state of the incoming light and spin state of the outgoing light and everything is hunky-dory and you know what the uh, spin angular momentum transfer is. If I want to do it with orbital angular momentum, I can do it by getting position into gauss lagrange beams of light. So I can take any type of beam, look at it with some means, and decompose it to its components, and then I can characterize orbital angular momentum on each of the components, measure it, and get the answer. So we are very lucky because um, if I do this decomposition, Fourier transfer recognition using the hologram in Fourier plane is very easy to, easy to do because gauss lagrange beams of light are self Fourier transforms. Okay, so that's that's the basis of it. Before I go into it, I just wanted to show you that there are certain things which are happening with lights which are very highly false. So basically, we were talking all the time after this lecture about um, paraxial approximation for everything that I was doing. So my lights were gone very close to optics axis, and everything was very easy. However, if I use highly focused laser beams or beams of light, they have different characteristics to lose these ones. And uh, there are polarization effects. Uh, which influence the angular momentum. And obviously, if I'm in the microscope and the whole optical tweezers stuff is done in the microscope, then I will have also aberrations in the microscope. So, microscope objective is a, a beast which is very difficult to control as far as aberrations are concerned. And in principle, you can pay a hell of a lot of money to get an uh, objective which is corrected for most of this. But again, the objective is only made to work at certain part or at, at, at the focal plane of the instrument. And if you are not doing that, then you will be introducing aberrations. Okay. So aberrations and refractive index mismatches cause beam distortions, and polarization distortions and correct, correction may cause polarization distortion as well. So what is shown here? is that I take gauss lagrange beam of light and I focus, I put it to 100 times numerical, it's 100 times objective with high numerical aperture, and all of a sudden this, this is of course modeling because it's very difficult to, to measure this profile in situ, but the modeling shows that the, this very elongated part of the beam along the axis. So it's quite a distorted beam, and the question is, can I then define what sort of or to angular momentum transfer that I will have in a situation like that. Okay, so there are different methods, as I said, to measure or to angular momentum, mode decomposition, rotational frequency shift, uh, or a wavefront measurements, in, and various mode converters can be also used. Okay, and here is a little modeling again of how the beam looks in three dimensions, when it goes, this is gauss lagrange beam of light, I don't know, um, LG03, let's say, and we are looking at it in three dimensions. So it's very um, elongated, a very elongated Z um, uh, position, uh, Z uh, characteristics of this beam. Now, some
somebody up there will ask me what do we see here. These are the, just the artifacts of how it is done. This is again interference fringes, but this is just computational interference fringes. So it was supposed to be nice, smooth profile. But it didn't work very well. Okay, so now I want to address the way of measurement of all the angular momentum by uh, mode decomposition. Okay, so just a little bit of reminder of what we have said before. So if I have an incoming beam of light, which is LG00 mode, which means Gaussian beam, and I put it onto a phase hologram, I told you that I will create Gaussian beams of light of higher order, higher charge. So this is Gauss Laguerre 02, which means that if the Gauss uh, beam or LG00 is going, is, is uh, focused in the middle of the structure, in the zero order, I will, this is like a diffraction gradient, so in the zero order I will still get the lowest order beam, which means the one that I have put in, but in first order I will get Gauss like a zero minus two mode because that was zero two mode here, okay? And in uh, uh, first order downwards or minus first order, I'll get Gauss like a uh, zero minus two mode. So plus two, minus two, and they are identical, right? Okay. So again, through Gauss will be into the sides to the first orders. Gauss uh, like a zero plus minus two. What I'm also saying here, and that will be important later, that if this is purely Gaussian beam, this is purely zero to uh, a hologram, which is cleverly done, there will be no higher orders. Okay? There are no residual orders in, in, uh, into the side. Okay, so now if I take one of those modes that I got in my first transmission, for example, 0 plus 2 LG mode, and I put it to the same hologram, another one of the same uh, order, so I have gauss like a 0, 2 phase hologram, and then now I'm putting 0 plus 2 uh, gauss like straight through I will get the same mode, but what will I get to the sides? I will get Gaussian downwards and plus 4 upwards. Okay? Everybody is happy with that? That's simple. So can you already guess, without looking for the next slide, how we will be looking at the mode decomposition in the beam carrying orbital angular momentum? Uh, object which will align, 
if I have elongated beam, elliptical beam, then this object will rotate in, if illuminated with light carrying or orbital spin or orbital angular momentum, it will align itself with the axis. Okay, so back to my measurement. Okay, so if I have, uh, have elliptical beam, I can decompose it into pure gas like beams of light. Okay, so this elliptical beam will have zero, zero bound, plus two and minus two mark. Okay, so then the scattering of the phase object changes the angular momentum of light, we said. So if I know that this originally was looking like that, this object will now change uh, the mode composition of this one after transmission. So if I put another hologram here, I can decompose it into its original mode and see how it differs from what I had to start. Okay, so here is the example. So this is my rod. So this is a phase object. So you can see that the phase is varying here through the object. And this is macroscopic experiment. This is not done under the microscope. Uh, so I create this um, glass plate with the phase object. And then I have a laser. I put the, my light through an iris, which I can adjust to be uh, just a spherical uh, iris or elongated beam or whatever I want to have. In this case, it's spherical um, Gauss, Gaussian beam. And then I have a hologram and some sort of lens rotating screen. And I'm looking at it in the camera. So the idea is, let's see how much, depending on what my input light is, how much this object is changing the beam and how much then optoangular momentum is transferred to it from the beam. Okay? And this rotating screen is put here not for a very scientific reason, but if I wouldn't have it, I would have a lot of speckle and I wouldn't be able to look at the pattern on the screen. But if I rotate it, I get rid of the speckle. So just looking at it will be much easier. Uh, and here, I would also stress that I'm doing it in parallel approximation. So the simple LG mode analysis should be valid here. OK, and it is. So what I do have here first is I test, test the method. So I look at the, uh, I, I put the Gaussian beam in here. Uh, in, perfect, in the perfect way, and I'm looking that I have in, uh, in the answer, I have perfect, in the transmission through a hologram, I have perfect um, um, uh, um, gauss like 2 modes. And that is compared with um, uh, first order from an analysis hologram, and you can see it is now, so I'm going with gauss Lega 2 towards a hologram which is 0, 2. So straight through I should have 0. And to the side I should have, sorry, straight through I should have the same. Upwards I should have Gaussian beam and downwards I should have 0, 4. Yes? 0, 2 onto hologram. This is the answer. So it sort of looks quite good. This is not perfect Gaussian, but a little bit distorted Gaussian, and that can be analyzed that it looks like zero four. So that works. Okay. So now I want to measure, uh, take LG02 into rod al uh, uh, alignment and look at it at different geometries. So this is the answer I get. So I, I will be changing now the position of the rod and looking at the transmitted light through the analysis hologram and see what sort of modes of light I can observe. So um, this is when I'm putting uh, a Gaussian beam. This is when I'm putting 0, 02 beam. This is when I'm putting elongated beam through the hologram. And this is I'm putting it through the rod one way, and this is putting it through the rod the other way. So the, the rod is pointing either this way or that way. And you can see that it's pretty obvious that the changes are taking place. So if I analyze that, I should be able to tell you 
what sort of order I want them into composition I have. Okay, and, and those pictures do follow very much what you see here in my drawings. So if the rod was this way in the elevated beam, you can see that in the transmitted light we see it that way and that way on the other side and opposite in the other direction. So it looks like it is able to analyze something. So now I will rotate, I have this LG02 coming onto the, uh, onto the rod and I'm rotating the rod and you can see that I, uh, I have my full rotation 360 degrees. These are the, the blue are my experimental results and the theory is in red. And so we actually can analyze the torque on the uh, rotating phase object uh, very precisely. If I put now rods in elliptical beam, I can also look at the torque efficiency transfer depending on what sort of phase thickness of the rod I have, so how many wavelengths of phase thickness I have. And again, we can see that I vary the phase, the phase thickness or the changes in phase by almost one or one, actually. And you can see that torque efficiency has its maximum at certain value there. And again, if we compare it with uh, theoretical results of mode decomposition, uh, you can see that it agrees very well. So the maximum of the transfer in such a situation of transfer of torque to angular momentum is 0.8 h bar per photon. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, so I can measure the orbital angular momentum pure, through purely optical experiment. Uh, and the experiment agrees with theory. Orbital angular momentum was 0.8 h bar per photon. Well, I didn't show you that number, but if I would do the same calculation for the transfer of spin angular momentum, it was much less, order of magnitude less. So if we really want to transfer a lot of orbital angular momentum to some machines, flows, whatever it is, it's better to do it with orbital angular momentum, or both, but doing it with spin is much less efficient. And the, this, the fact that we can transfer that much orbital angular momentum per photon makes it also quite usable for, for the purposes that we just said. Okay, so is it really feasible to measure orbital angular momentum in physics? Okay, so, so we know that mode decomposition is great, right? It does show results we want to see. It's easy to implement. Mathematics behind it is easy and easy to understand and all the rest of it. Now, if I put it into optical tweezers, what is changing? Well, that was the first thing that I showed you, that the beams look very funny. Okay, does that mean, so, so also they are highly focused and therefore paraxial approximation that I was using in my macroscopic experiment does not work or possibly doesn't work. So let's see what we can do. Well, we can try to do the same, and this is what I will do. So I take Gauss-Laguerre beam of light, I put it on the phase object, and I change this Gauss-Laguerre beam of light. And of course, that tells me what sort of phase object I had, right? And how much orbital angular momentum I transfer. This is nothing new. This is what we did in microscopic case. Okay, so I choose my object. I take my dumbbell that I showed you to rotate very fast in orbital angular momentum beam. I illuminate it with this orbital angular momentum beam. It can be 0, 02, 0, 04, 0, 08, whatever. And then I look at the structure of the beam which is transmitted to this object or reflected. Now, how do I do it? Well, obviously, this is a phase object, so it will change the beam. So now I want to take this beam and look what it is composed of. Okay, what are the components? So basically I need to put on the way to my screen, I need to put a hologram, uh, analysis hologram, and then see what sort of intensity profile I get in every mode, and that will tell me how much uh, orbital angular momentum I have in, in that matter, transfer there. So here is the thing. And it won't work. 
No. Okay. So if it would work, watch. Ah, oh, it does work. Right there. Okay, not on my screen, but on your screen. Yeah. Okay. Not very much, but you could see the idea of it. So I'm illuminating with gas like a zero two. The dumbbell is sitting in the beam like so, okay, and it's rotating with certain speed. And if I increase the power in the beam, of course, I can rotate it much faster. Okay, so that's the idea. So then I look at, okay, let me just show you the results all together. So then I do these experiments repetitively. So firstly, I do it without any particle in the beam. I just put my beam, uh, my gas like a zero two, through the analysis hologram, which is zero two. And so here it's zero two. This is supposed to be Gaussian there, and so on it goes to the sides. And as you can see, there are many modes in this incoming beam. So the way I have produced my hologram, although I call it zero two, the biggest intensity will be in zero two. However, in other orders, there's still plenty of light. Okay, so now I put two particles into the beam, and I rotate them, and then I have my analysis hologram, and I look at the light intensity distribution after my hologram. And it doesn't look that nice, but if you analyze it, it predominantly shows that you actually transfer the orbital momentum to zero to mode. But, as you can see, there are other bits and pieces which are non-zero. So it's not a very clean system. So I can measure it, but I, I, I'm not measuring it very precisely. You agree? <coughs> so then you could say, what can you do about it? Well, the problem is that if, if, if I could produce a hologram which only definitely had nothing more but zero to uh, um, analysis hologram, which only had zero to emission in, uh, in, in emitted only zero two, then it would make things much easier. And you can do it by producing blazed hologram, but even in blazed holograms, it's very difficult not to have higher to have higher orders. Especially when it's going through high numerical aperture chip. Because things get mucked up in the focal plane. Okay. So then uh, we decided okay we will again look at the same experiment as what I did macroscopically, but now I will do it under the microscope and see what sort of results I can get. So I take gas like a beam of light and I put a glass micronaut into it in the focal plate. So I move this slide through and introduce the object. Okay? And I measure the difference in the angular momentum. And again, as you can see, actually I think that this should play. Yep. So this is getting the rod going into the beam and through the beam and to the other side. And you can see that obviously a lot is happening here, so you can analyze what's happening in, in different modes here. And then you can plot it, and you can see that it, in fact, shows that this is a method to measure uh, that my gas like beam of light was zero two. So I am measuring the orbital angular momentum of that particular beam. However, you can also see that there are higher order modes here, besides. So this method is not that fantastic. And again, it is it is it is it is caused by the fact that uh, uh, I have highly focused laser beams. Okay, so the paraxial approximation here and this mode decomposition of being self uh, Fourier transform, etc., etc., is not not that well defined for this type of beams. Okay, so I want to find a method where I can cheat the system and basically use spin angular momentum to determine what orbital angular momentum I have in the system. And this figure you know already, so now 
I will put something uh, in gas ligand beam online and rotate it, or in Gaussian beam and rotate it with the elongated object or whichever way we want to do it. So here it's circular beam. But in principle, what I want to do is to be able to do this sort of measurement, which was easy, but with the beams which transfer orbital angular momentum. And then I will do only one approximation, and it is to say that spin and orbital angular momentum are conserved. So the total angular momentum is sum of spin and orbital angular momentum. Okay, so that's the idea. I measured the change in the polarization when the particles are rotating uh, for different polarizations. Okay? I have a low Reynolds number and I have a Italian fluid. So I assume that my total torque on the object is spin torque plus orbital torque. Okay, so this is some sort of a constant and this is rotational. So I have to have free rotation, multiple measurements, and laminar throw in the tunnel fluid. And we can do that. Because if I have water, I have no tunnel fluid. If I'm in something else, it might be different. But anyway, it's laminar flow and very low, uh, low Reynolds number. So the idea is that if I measure it for this, if I measure uh, the total torque on the object for linearly polarized and then uh, orbital uh, beam, with, which is linearly polarized with the orbital angular momentum, and circularly polarized left handed and right handed, I have three experiments, and this is really a straight line if I plot it. So then I will be able to determine from that straight line uh, the transfer of orbital angular momentum. Okay. Oh, what, what happened there? Okay, yes, now I know. Okay, so in, in order to do that, I want to create objects which I can rotate in Gaussian beams. Okay? So those objects uh, are created using two photon photopolymerization process. And we heard in the lectures uh, from Alfred on femtosecond lasers what happens in femtosecond laser when we use femtosecond laser in spectroscopy. So basically, this whole method of two photon photopolymerization is to be able to produce very tiny objects of the order of few microns in size. And the idea is something like this that if I take a, a two photon laser, so this is doing a transition, which is not in the transition here, two photons on top of each other, the, I'm in the same environment here, so I'm putting light through a high numerical aperture objective. You can see that if I use for excitation of this, of this whatever it is, dye, here one photon, then I have fluorescence coming off it throughout the entire uh, thickness of the, of the microscope slide, uh, microscope ch chamber. However, if I have two photon process, which is non-linear process, the focal spot, uh, the fluorescence is only coming from the focal spot. So if I have some sort of a resin inside this chamber, and if I need ultraviolet light, which it will be if I take two red photons, that transition will be in ultraviolet, then I will only, if, if this resin is hardened with ultraviolet photon, then it will be hardened only in this particular place, okay? Instead of being hardened in the whole body. And that I can use, and this is shown pictorially here what we are doing. So we basically can take highly focused laser light with two photon excitation process into a resin, and resin is just a type of chemical that will harden when you illuminate it with ultraviolet light as a chemical reaction taking place. And of course I will harden it in a particular place. If I now move my microscope slide, in a given pattern, I can create fantastic shapes to my lighting, and you can see that this ball here is about nine microns across, and we can see quite substantial details in here, so it's really easy to do. 
So you need femtosecond laser and you need the resonator. Okay, so there's the setup. We can do exactly that. We bring, we bring a, um, a, a femtosecond laser here, which is at about 780 nanometers wavelength. So I get in two photon process, I get ultraviolet light. I have my resin on the, on the microscope slide. And then I, I produce those, those little structures, and I'll show you what structures we produce in rotating all to angular momentum beams. And then I rotate those structures using all the tweezers, and I do the same sort of uh, detection as I was showing you before to measure the spin angular momentum transfer. Okay, so here is the production. So this is how it is, is done. We produce those, those shapes. The shape can be anything, of course. We produce them by switching light off and on and moving the slide and programming the structure. So here is one structure being produced and hopefully it will play. So this is little off, um, offset cross that we produce. And you can see that there is laser beam there. And we are wiggling the stage in a sequence. And then you can see that this cross is being built. Okay, it's a very slow process. But it works. So its structure takes 15 minutes. It doesn't have to do that. Is this the smallest 3D printing you can get? <laughs> well, it's an interesting question. Actually, there is a there is a commercial machine available now from Germany, which is called Nanoscribe, and it does exactly that in parallel. Many, many, many uh, objects at the same time, except that the structures are a little bit bigger. So. Again, our structures are not the smallest built with two photon photopolymerization, but they are on the smaller end of the scale. But in principle, I mean, you can build anything today down to nanometers. Okay. Okay, so I take a symmetric cross, so I'm choosing objects I want to have. So I'm taking a symmetric cross because I want to put it in a gas like a beam of light. So I construct that by the two photon photopolymerization process. And then I put it into the beam. No, come on. And I rotate it in the beam. And we have this uh, little line built on the microscope side just to show that this is three dimensional trapping. So it sits in gas like a beam of light and it's trapped. And we can move it freely so that it doesn't touch microscope slide. So we are using the tracking beam with all two angular momentum, it's zero two. Uh, and I'm using three different polarizations of the beam. So as I said, I take it to be first linearly polarized, then left-handed circularly polarized, right-handed circularly polarized, and then I measure the torque each time. Okay? And um, simulated drag torque, we can add also calculate it is about four, five point four picometer micrometer, and then optically measured torque is 4.8 plus minus 07 picometer micrometer. So it does agree pretty well, so we are transferring about 0.2 H bar per photon. So here is the measurement. So it's really quite simple, as I said, what we assume here is the total torque acting on the object is the sum of spin torque plus orbital torque, so it's a constant times omega, which is the rotation rate. And then I take, I can, and, and then I'll get my, my uh, 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 orbital angular momentum as omega zero over alpha. So I take this line, here's my alpha, here's my omega, so these are the three measurements. And uh, they pretty much are on one line. So this approximation sort of works, okay? So by feeding data to a linear function, I can then determine what sort of orbital angular momentum I have. So the orbital angular momentum, as I showed you, is 10 times higher than the spin component. And of course, I can create massive amount of different structures in order to measure and to transfer orbital angular momentum. Okay, but it is still cheating a little bit, okay? Because this is not exactly direct measurement of orbital angular momentum because I am making assumption that the total torque is a linear combination of, well, it's sum of spin and auto angular momentum. 
This is only really true, again, in parasite approximation, strictly speaking. Somehow it agrees in highly focused laser beams, but the question is whether it's only a fluke or whether it's really true. So then we said, okay, we still want to use this mode decomposition uh, 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 methodology for measuring orbital angular momentum directly in the highly focused uh, 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 environment. Okay, so here it is, we're doing it again. And this time, what we are trying to do is slightly different to what we did before. Namely, this is just the experiment which was done by our friends in Glasgow, where they are uh, uh, using SLM with Shaq Hartman away from sensor to look at the uh, beams of light produced in in optical tweezers. So uh, if so, so, let's skip this one. Um, uh, basically, or maybe I should no, it's okay. So if I plot beam intensity of the light, so I'm shining the light onto, so, so the system looks like I was showing it before. I'm shining light from the microscope onto my Shaq Hartman um, sensor. And um, I'm looking at the beam displacement uh, 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 vector. When I have the Gauss Lavier beam of light without any rod in, inside and with the rod. And if you sort of squint, you can see that there is a rod here. If you squint your eyes, you can see that there is a rod there. And if you analyze it, and looking at the beam displacement vector using this Shaq Hartman uh, uh, recognition pattern, well, it's, there is a little bit of difference between these this pictures, and uh, well, you can see that something is happening. So then we thought, okay, we will do this broad experiment or, or similar experiment, experiment with uh, direct measurement of in situ measurement of orbital angular momentum. So here is my Gauss Lavier beam of light. So this is the intensity profile of this beam. I'm, I'm putting it through my objective. Uh, it's in the focal plane. Then I'm bringing another set of tweezers into the system, which are trapping just normal particle, not rotating particle. And uh, uh, so this is top view of my beam, but this is this beam we are looking at. And then there is a particle sitting in Gaussian beam, and I'm taking it in, it's trapped, so I can measure its position, and then I'm taking it closer and closer to Gaussian beam in my life. And I'm trying to see whether by measuring what happens to this particle when it's scanned through the entire uh, beam of Gaussian beam of life, can I measure its displacement so that that displacement will then be Okay, so this is a normalized vector field of particle displacement, particle displacement in Gauss Lagier 08B. Um, okay, I suppose that you can see that it's Gauss Lagier beam, but whether it's easy to analyze it to be 08 is a different story, but that's how it looks. And this is 0. Minus, minus, zero minus eight, it looks pretty similar. And then we can look at the magnitude of force in Dico Newton on a, so this is the particle which is trapped in the Gaussian beam, and this is the particle I'm scanning through the field. So basically, in every place in this beam, Gauss, Gauss Lagier beam of light, I can, I can measure what sort of force is exerted on this trapped particle by looking at its displacement in the beam. And this is what I'm doing here. So this is LG08, and this is LG minus, uh, 0 minus 8. And you can see that they sort of look very similar. Okay? So in many ways, we can see that this is gauss lagier beam of light. Now the question is whether interpretation can be done that easily. Okay, so we played with it a little bit more because we didn't get much better results than that, so we just uh, redo the results a little bit and look at the 
a line integral convolution of particle displacements, uh, and we can see uh, that those sort of waves are showing how the particle, uh, uh, what sort of path particle will take on throughout the field. So it is no doubt that we can uh, plot uh, even the radial force on such inside beams, which such beams would exert, and that was what we were after. But whether we can be so certain about the results to higher accuracy, that's another story. Okay, so uh, as the very last thing that I will talk about today is that uh, I suppose that we can say that we have several methods for measuring orbital angular momentum in our rotating objects, for our rotating objects. Um, but the question is still maintains to be answered how good those methods are, uh, how precise they are, and how confident we are about using them. So instead of that, what, what I will finish off with showing off, I really want to show off now, is that we have other methods for producing gas locations of light. And so you would say, why bother? You have shown us so many, so many methods which work. Why continue doing it? So, um, um, very often, optical tweezers are actually used by people who are not that interested of, in physics of optical tweezers. What they're interested in is to be able to manipulate something, to do biology with it, to do fluid dynamics with it, or whatever it could be. These people don't want to play with highly uh, uh, not so well functioning holograms or incredible quality uh, algorithms and so on and so forth. They want to turn something on and then get the beam they want without having to do much work about it. And the easiest way would be that everybody knows how a microscope works, so if I can now put normal laser light into the microscope, which is Ga Gaussian beam, Gaussian beam into the microscope, and then just push some sort of slide through, which will enable me to get Gauss like a beam of light in the focal spot, that would be very good. Easy. Push the button, thing walks in, and you can do with it what you want. Okay, so this is what I'm after. So again, what I do is that I now want to produce something which I called on this slide, I called it micro-optical diffraction element. So basically what I'm after is to use two photon photopolymerization process to produce on microscope slide a face plate. A hologram, okay? So this hologram will be about 5 to 10 microns in size, okay? And the question is that I want to program it in such a, in such a way in the production phase, not in the usage phase, that it will give me gauss like a beam of light to my light. Okay. So again, I showed you this, this thing before. So basically I need femtosecond laser uh, to be able to produce my structures. And then I need to, so this is, I'm producing them here. So I'm constructing in, in an algorithm to produce a wave plate. Uh, and uh, uh, so, um, yeah, so I can decide what sort of wave plate I want to have. And then I produce it. And then I bring optical tweezers into it and I start playing with it. And this structure now is, is lying in my solution, is, is lying on the microscope slide. So whatever I have in my um, experimental chamber can now be trapped using gauss again in my life. Okay, so this is my structure that I produced. So here we are producing a 0 for gauss again 0 for beam of light. So this is the phase length which will produce it and I can change the number of teeth on this on this face plate and I can produce all sorts of gas that give me more beams of light which I wish to have. Uh, I illuminate it with certainly polarized light. I don't know why we have this. Okay. I don't know what's happening here. Okay. Uh, so what will happen now is that the light is coming from this way. It's going through the face plate 
Now, comes the day being light of light is produced. I take my other produced cross, which I showed you before. I put it to this Gauss Lagier beam of light. And of course, here, in this part of my experiment, I'm dealing with Gauss Lagier beam of light. So this thing should rotate. I can put it in a channel and do certain things with it. So let us do that. OK. So I marry this two. And this is how they look when they are produced in a scanning electron microscope. So they are not looking very nice actually, but they are good enough. And they look much more impressive in optical microscope because you can see so little. <laughs> and then this is, this is the idea behind it of course, that I'm coming with TEM00, gas in B, face plate, gas like A04, I get it, I have my rotor. And it sticks. Okay, so this is what we were talking about. Um, and so here is my optically driven rotor. So here you can see the rotor, it's lying in the solution. And here, so this is the cross, okay, that I produced. You can hardly see it, but you will see it when it comes to calculus. And this is my faceplate. And the faceplate is sitting on the microscope slide. And now I will drive the microscope slide over the rotor and see whether it will start rotating. Okay. Okay, so here I come. And now the gas that the beam of light is on top of the rotor, and you can see obviously that it's rotating. And of course, you can measure all the triangular momentum of it the same way as we have shown before. And when you take the plate with the orthogonal momentum plate off, of course it drops. So it's not trapped here. And now we are trapping only it. Okay, just to show you that it is a cross. Okay, so what, what's good about it? Well, you can if about it as much as you want, you can make build flows with it, you can do whatever. So we are saying, okay, it's a, it's a sorter. Somebody asked me about sorting before. So you can do sorting here. So this is an artist impression, bad artist impression, about red blood cells, which we then bring into our rotor. And depending on what we are measuring, uh, what properties of the cells we are measuring, we can put them which, whichever way we want. Okay, and with that I just acknowledge that the, the, the work was done predominantly by other people than me. And here are some people who are in the group now. There are many other names, of course, of people who have done the work which contributed to this lecture. And with that, I would like to thank you. Any final questions? Thank you.